Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Charlton, and I am the Sales and Marketing Manager at Academic Studies Press. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to watch the recording of this event, uh, which is a part of our ASP and Conversation series. Unfortunately, uh, when we had the event live, the host of the event, that's me, uh, forgot to hit the record button at the beginning of the presentation. And so the following recording, unfortunately, does not include the original introductions uh, by both Professor Kakandas uh, and the author of the book in discussion, Professor Ryokova, uh, which were both very thoughtful. And it also does not include uh, the first question presented by Professor uh, Kakandas, as well as the insightful uh, response to that question, uh, which nicely tied in the theme of the book with uh, the pandemic today. Uh, so my apologies to both of our guests, as well as to the viewers of this recording, who will unfortunately miss out on those initial elements. Uh, that said, the following recording does include the majority of the conversation. Uh, it also begins at a great place, even if it does so a bit abruptly. Uh, so we certainly encourage you uh, to keep viewing regardless. Uh, with that, I would like to take this opportunity to reintroduce uh, both of our guests. Our moderator, Professor Irene Kakandes, is the Dartmouth College Professor of German Studies and Comparative Literature, and also teaches in the fields of women's, gender, and sexuality studies and Jewish studies. Her publications include Teaching the Representation of the Holocaust, edited with Marion Hirsch, published in 2005, Daddy's War, a Paramemoir, published in 2009, Let's Talk About Death, written with Steve Gordon, published in 2015, Eastern Europe on Mapped, edited with Yulia Kumska, published in 2017, and the forthcoming volume she edited, titled On Being Adjacent to Historical Violence, coming out this year. She's a past president of the German Studies Association and of the International Society for the Study of Narrative Literature, and has edited the series Interdisciplinary German Cultural Studies, for the Greater Verlag since 2005. And to introduce the author of the book, Professor Galina Raukova uh, is Associate Professor of Russian Studies at the University of Florida. She is also the author of the book titled The Archaeology of Anxiety, The Russian Silver Age and Its Legacy, published by University of Pittsburgh Press in 2007. Her research interest includes psychology of creative personality, biography, and uh, Russian theater. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to pick up now where the recording did start. My apologies again, and enjoy. For those who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, I was wondering, could you just give um, a sketch of how the book then is structured in its final version? Mm -hmm. um, I realized uh, that I was going to have two uh, literary giants, uh, Chekhov and Tolstoy, uh, who were always uh, in dialogue uh, with one another, although this uh, dialogue was uh, superficially one-sided. Uh, it is well known that Tolstoy on several occasions wanted to talk to Chekhov about this and uh, posterity, uh, which Chekhov uh, modestly <laughs> declined. Uh, and uh, the difference between Chekhov and Tolstoy is that uh, Tolstoy was a healthy, robust individual who kept uh, writing until uh, his very last days, uh, while Chekhov uh, was... Uh, uh, <laughs> diagnosed officially with tuberculosis in his late 20s, but early on he knew that uh, he had uh, that particular disease. So for him, the talk about death uh, was uh, not particularly high on his agenda, although he used to think about it, but he really didn't want to. Um, to talk uh, about it the way Tolstoy uh, wanted someone to talk to him about death. And that was uh, his wife's problem because she was also too young to, uh, to um, 
to share, tell stories, thoughts about death and mortality because she simply had to take care of uh, their children, of their gigantic household. She was doing all sorts of scenes. So I decided that these two writers uh, whom I describe as uh, perpetual beginners because what they definitely have in common is when they faced a writing block or a situation that was out of their control, they both uh, had this urge to start everything in you, to start uh, everything uh, from scratch, to discard uh, the previous uh, script, to, dis to discard the previous plan. Uh, and uh, once I <laughs> established for myself that commonality, then I decided that I will structure the book around uh, the um, midlife crisis for Chekhov, I think that midlife crisis co uh, coincided with his writing The Step when he was in his late 20s. So with Tolstoy, <laughs> his midlife crisis occurred when he was uh, in his uh, late uh, 40s. So the first part of the book was about Tolstoy and Chekhov dealing uh, with the impossible situation that was in part their own creation and in part it was imposed on them by uh, their relatives, family members, their mentors, uh, by the reading public uh, in general. And the idea that I wanted to emphasize was that I do believe that the conflicts in the lives of uh, Russian writers uh, were not necessarily due uh, to their opposition with the existing uh, political regime or any political leaders, but uh, to a greater extent, uh, their problems were caused uh, by people who were uh, worshipping these writers, who wanted to help, uh, who wanted to do everything for them, but uh, they were uh, asking for the impossible scenes. I mean, just to put it uh, in the most straightforward way, they wanted these writers to go on creating uh, the same uh, over and over again with Tolstoy, it would have been writing another version of his childhood or another version of War and Peace, another version of Anna Karenina and so on and so forth. Once the reading public discovers what they really like about this or that writer, they tend not to want uh, any particular change. And with Tolstoy, his family, they just loved what he wrote prior to 1877, and they didn't want him to change his style. They didn't want to change his way uh, of addressing uh, his uh, readers, which was about to happen. And uh, that's when Chertkov became particularly useful uh, for Tolstoy to put these plans uh, into motion. Um, then I also wanted to to uh, show how uh, Tolstoy and uh, Tolstoy's and Chekhov's thoughts about death, creative death, about mortality, posterity, how they influenced uh, other people like uh, Bunin, who kept thinking about Tolstoy and uh, Chekhov uh, during his um, life. Um, then I uh, felt bold enough to offer my own interpretation of uh, the cherry orchard, uh, which was uh, inspired uh, by Meyerhold's misreading of Chekhov's The Seagull, which allowed him to come up with his uh, new theater, with his new understanding of the role of the director and of the role of uh, the spectators in any given performance. Uh, so, so one of the things I observe in, in what you're telling us about the book is that um, you are very concerned with facts related to his, the actual biographies of these writers, facts related to Russian society at the time, and how those factors actually make their way into the literature, even into what the writers wanted or could 
or did not want to write. So I'm wondering, could you speak to that question of using biographical facts to talk about literature? Um, the academy, uh, professors, universities, for better or for worse, most people think for worse, tend to have fashions. And um, while in the early part of the 20th century into the mid or maybe even into the second half, we used biography quite a bit to understand literature. Nowadays, as a general principle or methodology, most people would consider um, biography as passe or irrelevant. Um, but obviously the message that, the, that you are trying to take from these writers involves looking at their lives as well as their creative output. So could you share with us a little more how you came to that uh, methodology, if I might call it that? Mm. Um, I wouldn't describe it as methodology, uh, but probably um, to a certain extent, I was encouraged uh, by the Russian formalists uh, who are responsible for this particular view of uh, writers' biographies to begin with. Uh, but somehow people tend to forget uh, that most formalists, uh, they actually became uh, biographers uh, towards uh, the end of uh, their literary uh, careers. Uh, or went on writing one uh, volume of Tolstoy's biography uh, after another. And uh, Eichenbaum used to say that uh, Tolstoy was uh, his uh, mistress, that had it not been for Tolstoy, he would have been uh, dead. That uh, just writing about Tolstoy, uh, getting reacquainted with uh, certain uh, aspects of Tolstoy's life, that's what uh, kept him going, that's what kept him uh, alive. Um, well, I'm uh, too old now to conceal <laughs> the fact that I am interested in writers' lives. And uh, I realize, uh, and that was probably a discovery uh, while I was writing this book, that I'm only writing about people uh, that are meaningful to me at this or that particular stage in my own uh, development. So when I was writing this book, I was also learning something um, about myself. So uh, I doubt uh, that my <laughs> interpretation of the death of Ivan Ilyich 20 years ago would have been any similar to my current interpretation that I included in uh, uh, this book. Uh, I do believe that uh, writers, uh, and uh, this is very different from the Symbolist Life Creation Project, uh, when symbolists wanted uh, their lives to be as dazzling, as original, as novel, as uh, best works of art. Here I'm talking about different sort of different type of creativity. I think that any creative person needs uh, to create a certain environment uh, that suits his or her particular way of uh, creating, of uh, working. Uh, and it's not uh, a revelation. We know that uh, people are inventive enough uh, to use uh, their illnesses or sicknesses <laughs> to suit uh, them, uh, to explain uh, their inability to take part in certain scenes. As with Proust, uh, he would use his asthma as an excuse for not attending certain functions. Uh, people uh, would have been on edge because until very late, they wouldn't know whether Proust was going to, uh, to attend uh, their functions, their gatherings. Uh, so I think that that was uh, his way of uh, 
Saudians, Russians that he really didn't want to do or wanted to do because although he was very sick, he would still go to this or that gathering. So his sickness wouldn't stop him, but it would definitely allow him not to do things that he didn't want uh, to be doing. The same with Chekhov. Once Chekhov decided that uh, he was no longer going to work uh, as a doctor for very good reason because uh, he really didn't like being a doctor to his own brother who died on him and uh, he felt that uh, he really didn't want to be uh, a doctor to his uh, own brother uh, but once uh, he had uh, he lost this ability to use his uh, uh, medical duties as an excuse uh, for not meeting this or that uh, deadline. He was at a loss and you could see it in his letters that he's just groping for a valid reason and he just can't find it. And of course, later his health became uh, a reason uh, which was not uh, taken uh, sufficiently by his uh, contemporaries as happened when he was unable to finish the cherry orchard and they were just saying come on it's just a play just a play just write something that you've already written we don't mind if it is a repetition be repetitive just finish just finish the play and that's it so um and uh, that idea came from my previous book when I was uh, looking closely at Ahmadova's life and uh, at uh, her interlocutors' uh, impressions from what she was doing. And then I realized that there was a great discrepancy between what Ahmadova found uh, particularly conducive uh, to her creativity and what other people uh, saw as being conducive to her state of being creative, uh, like her famous communal apartment. I think that it gave her numerous excuses and opportunities uh, for not being as creative uh, as she had been expected. Um, so you mentioned at some point in the book that you consider death a great enabler for Tolstoy. Could you tell us a little more what you mean by that? What exactly did it enable? And, and even what do you mean by death? Do you mean the thought of death, the thought of mortality? Uh, do you mean illness? So what was enabling what for Tolstoy in your view? I think I used uh, that particular statement about death being a great enabler for Tolstoy when I was discussing um, that famous uh, anecdote uh, when Tolstoy was uh, elated when he learned uh, that once you've been bitten by a mad dog, you're going to die in six months. And he felt that he could do all sorts of things uh, within those months, that he could tell people what they should be doing, how they should be um, behaving <laughs> during uh, the rest of their lives, that that would be an opportunity for him to tell the truth. Uh, because he was uh, about to die, so people would feel that uh, he had uh, this valid excuse for telling the truth. And then he was greatly, hugely disappointed that that was not true, that you can go on living for another 10 years, 10 months, uh, you name it. And uh, he was greatly disillusioned. So uh, that's what allowed me to call death uh, as a great uh, enabler for Tolstoy. Uh, but Tolstoy's way of dealing with death uh, was similar to dealing with anything that was uh, beyond his control uh, as, um, as dry spells uh, that he uh, faced uh, uh, during the last 30 or 40 years uh, of his life. Um, if uh, in his use, uh, he would write in his diary that if I'm not going to write uh, a paragraph uh, in the next few days, I'm going uh, to commit suicide. Uh, supposedly it worked. Uh, he would frighten himself into go on writing. At the end of his life, uh, he turned uh, 
writing into uh, something that was forbidden uh, to him, almost sinful creative activity uh, was equated uh, with uh, sin uh, by Tolstoy. And he did the same with this. He was writing to Chertkov that um, I have been thinking about this. I really want to die, but I know that I'm not allowed to die just yet. The master knows, I mean, the master doesn't want me to die just that, but he could spend the rest of the day just writing and uh, thinking about his desire to die. So this was his way of taming this uh, sort of anxiety by turning it into something desirable, but not available, not readily uh, available to him. Just going back to your question, what do I mean by this? Uh, I probably <laughs> mean something that um, the Georgian, uh, Soviet, Russian philosopher Mirab Mamardashvili uh, meant uh, by uh, death uh, being part uh, of our uh, daily life, that death doesn't uh, happen uh, when life is over, death uh, being part uh, of uh, our daily life. And uh, he says that, uh, by death, I call uh, dead <laughs> thoughts, uh, dead matter. If uh, you surround yourself by other people's opinions, uh, this is uh, dead matter. Sometimes dead matter <laughs> occupies uh, uh, so much space that there is absolutely no room for your uh, personal development. And I think that for creative people, for writers, creative deaths, which as I said, is often uh, provoked uh, by people who are dearest and closest to you, who want you to produce more of the same. So creative deaths and physical deaths, uh, they're sort of somehow intertwined. I mean, uh, for uh, a creative person to wake up and realize uh, that uh, you're no longer going to write, to compose, to paint, uh, is an equivalent of uh, physical death. And uh, these two scenes, they are always looming large. At least that's how I understand it for creative people. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's look at that specific element about pressure from people from the outside that we like what you do, you know, um, War and Peace is a masterpiece, so keep writing War and Peace. Um, do you think that's different in the Russian context than in other cultural contexts? You mentioned Proust before, but in, you weren't necessarily talking about that same topic. So do you think it's um, creative writers anywhere or is it really something in Russian cultural life where the public looms so large in terms of giving permission, so to speak, or denying permission to a creative artists to change, to do something different. How, how do you see that? I, and if I could just tell a very personal anecdote, um, I uh, have only been to Russia once. I was in Moscow with some German friends who were uh, working there for a while. And I was so struck by the cultural scene, um, the enthusiasm of the audience at a music concert I was at, or we actually were able to go to the Bolshoi Ballet. Um, the, the power of the audience, you know, in bestowing approval was something that I had never experienced in any other country. So do you think that the Russian public is somehow more virile, if I could use that word, or more in the context in which you're saying almost more suffocating because they want to control what artists do. How, how do you see that nexus of issues? Um, that's a very interesting question, and I know exactly what you mean by that uh, concept. Um, uh, Russian literature is uh, uh, very young, uh, so the Russian public didn't have a lot of time uh, to learn um, as to how to deal uh, 
with uh, their writers, but it is uh, only one aspect of uh, that relationship, particularly if we think about the 20th century. It is unthinkable in any other uh, Western European country or in the, in the United States uh, to imagine the same uh, intimate uh, and explosive relationship uh, between um, writers uh, and uh, their readers. Uh, I think that uh, it owes a great deal to the fact uh, that people were being killed, uh, they were being exiled, they were being persecuted, they were being prosecuted, uh, you name it. And uh, the urge to be uh, immortalized uh, in the works uh, of your contemporaries was infinitely greater than anywhere else uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, some contemporary writers and poets whom I know on Facebook, uh, they're sort of trying to sustain that kind of a relationship by posting five, 10 times per day uh, their thoughts, their impressions, their photographs, uh, which personally I resent because I think that 90% of that stuff could have been um, kept uh, to themselves. Uh, but going back to writers like Tolstoy, it just occurred to me recently that he was not only running from his wife and from his family uh, in October of 1910, but I think he was also running from Chertkov and from his uh, modus operandi because Tolstoy started to function as a blogger towards the end of his life. He had to share his opinions uh, about everything. And there were so many, so many embarrassing situations. And I think that contemporary writers and poets, uh, they find themselves in similar embarrassing situations. Is when Tolstoy was uh, introduced uh, to a famous uh, uh, pilot uh, and pilots were very rare in those days. And uh, he was told, Lev Nikolaevich, this is Utochkin. I forgot his first and patronymic, this is Utochkin. Tolstoy looked at him uh, severely and then he said, well, young man, I wish uh, you uh, learned to walk before <laughs> you started to fly or something like that. But the statement was so, uh, was so uh, meaningless, uh, but Tolstoy felt that he absolutely had to say something. So it seems that he was running away from that uh, relationship that he was seeking uh, in the late uh, 1870s. He wanted to speak directly to his readers, but it seemed that uh, by the end of his life, uh, that started to interfere with his creativity. And when he ran away, he informed uh, Chertkov that he had uh, um, ideas for four new novels uh, that he was really going to write four new novels. Well, he contracted uh, 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 pneumonia. Uh, so these ideas were never materialized, uh, but uh, yes, that, I was, I that, that was the beginning of this very intense relationship between a writer and and, uh, his readers, because people would go to Tolstoy and ask him whether they should get married. Uh, Meyerhold went to talk to Tolstoy about whether he should play this or that role. Uh, and I think that that was uh, unbearable. And of course, the best examples in the 20th century would be Anna Akhmatova and Boris Pasternak, uh, who for very good reasons, because their works were not uh, published, uh, they would uh, read uh, their works out loud. They would listen to people's comments. Uh, and uh, I think that that was a very difficult, enlightening and uh, tedious relationship that they had to endure. Mm -hmm. So switching now to um some of the bigger claims of your book. I you talk about how um, really we should 
look at this topic because this topic being, of course, um, death and creativity, because it actually would allow us to make different kinds of decisions right now in the 21st century. And I was wondering, again, if you could expand on that a little bit. How do you see, you, you've made a wonderful case about writers and their publics. And I was just wondering, how do you see this issue of mortality in the lives of perhaps not necessarily very creative people and more specifically to your claim towards the end of the book, how would we um, be affected? How would our decisions, how would how we live our daily lives be affected if we thought about uh, mortality more? What What is the creative energy we could tap into there? I think that uh... I make that claim only with regard uh, to Chekhov's uh, last play, uh, The Cherry Orchard. Um, I was reading uh, all that literature about uh, dying uh, in the 21st century and how difficult it is for all people, I would say most people to come to terms uh, with the death of someone who is extremely dear, uh, dear to us. Um, and it seemed to me that Chekhov came up uh, with, uh, with an answer, uh, which I discuss in that particular chapter on uh, the cherry orchard. He sort of offered uh, some kind uh, some kind of a routine uh, of how to get used to the idea of saying goodbye to something that you can no longer preserve, at least uh, you can no longer preserve it with uh, your sort of human uh, abilities, uh, not with the help of some machines uh, that pump uh, air, blood or something else. Um, so I really don't want to sound presumptuous, so I don't want to sound like a moralizer. <laughs> um, in no way, I think that my book uh, can teach anyone um, anything, but I think that, uh, uh, that um, other critics' uh, interpretation of uh, the cherry orchard was a little bit uh, of uh, the mark particularly when people assume that uh, Chekhov himself uh, was negative uh, about uh, the demolition of the cherry orchard. And if you look at uh, recent uh, productions of the cherry orchard all over the world, I think each director is trying to highlight uh, the destruction of the cherry orchard as uh, an unsinkable event, as something that led to the Bolshevik revolution, Stalin's purges, uh, I don't know, Khrushchev's uh, uh, demolition of uh, various Soviet institutions. It's like the, the, the destruction of the cherry orchard is responsible for every tragedy uh, in the 20th century. I really don't believe in that. Um, so um, that's uh, probably well, a very unsatisfying no, answer to- um, No, no, I appreciate, I appreciate you um, being very specific and uh, specific about what claims you were making. I mean, as you know, my own view is, and I have published this and, and you have read my publications on this topic, that um, to think about mortality uh, and specifically our own mortality does allow us to make uh, better decisions about how to live our life right now, today. So um, it's certainly something I believe in, but I, I don't wanna put my own words um, into your mouth. Rather, we're going to, um, open up to the audience very soon. But I did wanna ask you um, one other, two other short things if I could. First of all, um, 
it was up on the screen before, but here's the beautiful book that Academic Press produced. And I was wondering if you could just tell us a little about the choice of the cover image and why William Blake, when your book is uh, so closely connected to Russian culture, um, was that a decision that you had a, a say in? It's not always the author who gets to decide covers, but, um, and if so, um, what would you like us to take from that? Besides the fact that it's a, a really striking image. Uh, I absolutely love William Blake's uh, illustrations or his own rendition of uh, the divine comedy. It is also meaningful uh, for me that this was his very last work. I think that he uh, made these illustrations during the last uh, six months uh, of his life and he was aware of his uh, impending uh, uh, end of his life and it is really mind boggling. I, I just love looking through, uh, through his uh, illustrations. Uh, this is uh, his illustration to counter one. So we see uh, Virgil opening his arms uh, to Dante, who is escaping these uh, three beasts uh, who uh, are standing in the way of uh, Dante's acquiring. Uh, knowledge about himself because his progression through hell, uh, as we all know, is about uh, facing uh, his, um, uh, his own indeficiencies and basically canceling one after another and that's how he progresses uh, to purgatory. Well, it was very hard to find uh, an illustration for this book because I, I didn't want uh, to to show a skull uh, or something like that. Uh, and I felt that these uh, three beasts, uh, that they convey this idea of something really horrible that uh, we have to face our fears, our anxieties, our indeficiencies, uh, even something that we don't want uh, to know about ourselves. Uh, but Vir Virgil is there. And in one of the chapters, uh, I talk about uh, Chertkov, uh, who was uh, Tolstoy's uh, muse and closest friend and publisher, his interlocutor. So I think that he played um, a similar role uh, for Tolstoy's Dante. So that was the image I wanted to I wanted to convey that uh, the help is there. And of course, when I'm saying that there were people who didn't understand that the writer cannot uh, uh, produce the same work over and over again, there were also many people who were instrumental in keeping those uh, writers going as with Chertkov and Sofia Andreevna was definitely instrumental uh, during the first 15 years uh, of uh, their life together, which we all know is a very, very long period of time. I mean, she was very happy to be Tolstoy's scribe, his interlocutor uh, and so on and so forth. So Great. Well, if it's okay with everyone, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions from the audience. And I would invite everyone to please turn your video back on. It's always nice to see people. And if you all have um, down in your lower menu, a reaction um, button, you'll see that one of the options is to raise your hand. So if you do touch that, I will know that you would like to ask a question. And when I call on you, you could just unmute. So do we have um, a question from the audience? I know usually it takes a moment for people to stop being shy, but you could also physically, if you have your camera on, you could physically raise your hand and I could, I could call on you that way too. Nice to see you all. Great. Is your first name pronounced Reed? Is that you? Yes, Wonderful. Okay, great, please. We'd love to hear from you. What's on your mind? Well, uh, first off, thank you for coming to talk with us. This has been very interesting. 
And I was wondering if you'd given any thought to contextualizing um, Alexander Pushkin's Autumn in Boldino, because that seems to really fit into the themes that you're chasing here. Because not only did he have a, a, a midlife crisis of sorts, but it was in the face of all this societal death. I was wondering if you could speak to that theme at all. Would you like to speak to that theme? You seem to be more familiar with that. All I can say is that uh, I think that uh, Pushkin discovered uh, that uh, he was most productive when he had uh, this imposed uh, solitude and he was trying to recreate the same conditions over and over again until his uh, death. Uh, but if you have thoughts about it, please share them because I'm, I'm extremely interested. Okay, great. Do Just we, thank you, ma'am. Do we have thank another you. questioner? Yes, please, Cheyenne? Yes. Um, well, unfortunately, I think part of my question was already answered because speaking of the concept of imposed solitude, I was going to ask you about Anna um, Mahtava when it comes to like her experience with communal apartments and how that affected her creativity. Um, sorry, give me one moment, but I'm listening to your answer. <laughs> so I think that was about Ahmatova and the um, living arrangements that she had. Is that right, Jan? Yeah. Yes, I was just going to ask if you could um, briefly discuss how her experience living in the communal apartment affected her creativity um, and if it was kind of a positive effect on her creativity in any way or if it, if it caused her to um, face more challenges than it, than it kind of aided that process for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that question. It just goes back to, to my uh, lawn. <laughs> long uh, life relationship uh, with Ahmatova and she interests me uh, greatly. Uh, I visited her communal uh, apartment on numerous occasions just to make sure that I understand which rooms she was allowed to occupy, how much privacy she was allowed to have and so on and so forth. And of course it's very difficult for us uh, to appreciate uh, all the intricacies of that uh, cohabitation of various lodges. Uh, she was invited uh, by Nikolai Punin uh, to share his room in that communal uh, apartment. It is not quite clear how much it was his uh, own doing, how much it was uh, Ahmatova's uh, desire <laughs> to become a lodger in that communal apartment, but nevertheless she uh, had uh, to live there with his uh, wife, uh, with his daughter from his first marriage. Later on she had to share the same apartment with his uh, new mistress, uh, then some rooms were occupied uh, by the, uh, not tenants, not the lodges, but basically people who were given uh, permits uh, to live uh, in the same apartment. And these were people who were uh, often uh, drunk, uh, who were uh, threatening each other, yet uh, Ahmatova was very friendly uh, with this uh, new lodges, was very fond of their children, was even writing poems about them. Uh, so uh, if you go and visit that apartment, I mean, you see that it is beautiful to a certain extent. I mean, most Soviet people <laughs> wouldn't have had uh, access to the same books, uh, to the same artifacts, to the same paintings and so on and so forth. When children uh, go to visit uh, that apartment as a museum, they are often lost for words. They don't know what uh, this uh, or that scene was about, how to use this or that scene, and that they start playing games and so on and so forth. Uh, some people write uh, that they would have loved to live in a similar apartment and that they would have definitely started to write poetry if they had a chance. So there is this uh, sort of... Uh, miscommunication. Uh, but for Ahmatova, when she was uh, told by Tchaikovsky that uh, 
you see everybody is dead. I mean, so now you are our Lev Tolstoy, you are our Andreev, you are our Yesenin, you name it. I mean, uh, that was like a huge compliment on Tchaikovsky's part, but I think that Akhmatova was dwarfed by that compliment because just to be Leo Tolstoy would be a great uh, a great burden for anyone uh, plus Bloch and Gumilov so all these people they perished and all of a sudden Akhmatova had to stand for all of them uh, so she came up uh, with uh, the party resolution that nobody seemed to be able to find she claimed uh, that uh, Stalin uh, issued a resolution which uh, uh, forbade her to write poetry. Uh, so everybody believed uh, her uh, statement. Everybody thought that she couldn't have uh, lied about it, but so far nobody was able to find any trace of that resolution. So she was comfortably not writing for at least 13 years. Uh, she was working on uh, her articles uh, about Pushkin, about his uh, different works. But she felt extremely comfortable because it was so understandable for other people. I mean, she was living in this horrible apartment, horrible, unresolved crisis, one crisis after another. I mean, how could she write under these circumstances? And uh, then she started to write, even uh, when her situation became worse as compared uh, to the early 1920s and people just felt that that was her superhuman ability to overcome adversity uh, which was fine for Ahmatova when she really felt uh, uh, felt uh, at odds uh, with her surroundings uh, was uh, during Khrushchev's saw when people started to ask for her new poems and she was unable to produce them on a daily basis. So that, that's when her life changed abruptly and she started to regret uh, all these liberal reforms and so on and so forth. So she would have preferred to live under Stalin. So all these liberating processes were detrimental to her well-being. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Is there another question? <coughs> coming from the audience? Plenty of time? Yes, please. Katie, you have to unmute. Earlier, you mentioned how writing the book uh, maybe changed your life or how it affected you. And I was wondering if you could just say a little bit more, if you haven't already come to it, about how your research and writing of that book might have um, changed you in some way. Um, thank you very much. That's uh, a very interesting question and uh, a question that is uh, sort of difficult uh, to uh, answer. Um, I think that when I was preparing <laughs> for this conversation and uh, I uh, started to read my own book uh, after a year or so of not uh, thinking about it, of not uh, reading uh, the text. There is this period when you are obsessed with your own book and then you sort of put it aside and uh, stop thinking the thoughts that uh, you were thinking while writing uh, this book and all of a sudden I realized uh, that uh, some ideas that I thought were new and original ideas that they were already uh, present uh, in uh, Tolstoy's uh, or William James's uh, own uh, texts and um, I think that I will just read you the quote so that you will understand what I mean. So at some point Tolstoy was writing to Nikolai Strachov uh, about uh, him feeling uh, old and obsolete. Mm -hmm. uh, Tolstoy was 47. Uh, so 
just a tiny uh, fraction of what he was writing. It's it's a very long letter. Uh, so um, and so I began to search for a view of life, which would do away with its apparent senselessness, being convinced that my despair did not come from an attribute of life itself, but from my view of it. So here is uh, Tolstoy. He's saying that, uh, that my despair did not come from an attribute of life itself, but from my view of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, his uh, efforts uh, to acquire <laughs> a new view um, of life. I just all of a sudden realized that Tolstoy had uh, expressed that. And uh, with Henry James, I used to, not Henry James, with William James, I used to laugh uh, at his description of Tolstoy's uh, midlife crisis because he is uh, comparing Tolstoy with Bunyan uh, and concludes that Bunyan was simply wasting uh, his uh, life, uh, that his efforts uh, to describe his uh, crisis uh, uh, were uh, not as significant as Tolstoy's. So he says about Tolstoy, um, by contrast, Tolstoy's crisis was the getting of his soul in order the discovery of his genuine habitat and vocation, the escape from falsehoods into what for him were ways of truth. It was a case of heterogeneous personality, tardily and slowly finding its unity and level. And though not many of us can imitate Tolstoy, not having enough perhaps of the Aboriginal human marrow in our bones, most of us may at least feel as if we might be better for, uh, better for us if we could. Uh, so I think that what I learned about myself is what basically reading my own book, reading other people's uh, uh, texts uh, was uh, that uh, by reading writers like Tolstoy, Chekhov, Bunin, uh, Meyerhold, who was a director, but also a prolific uh, writer, you can actually discover your own genuine habitat and vocation you can find your escape from falsehoods into what, uh, for us, uh, are ways of truth. I don't know whether it um, answers uh, your question, Katie. Uh, but life is an effort. When Irene was asking what um, we might learn, um, what can we apply to our experience with the pandemic, uh, it seems that that's exactly <laughs> what we can apply, that uh, we might, uh, with effort, under these circumstances, we can discover our genuine habitat and vocation. Um, I don't know how to put it better. I oh, think that's, that's great. That's great. convoluted. Thank you so much, Gloria. Yeah. yeah, that is great. And um, I just want to thank everyone again for coming. And I, I want to share with you, in case you don't realize that yet, that um, Dalia Ridkova is a beautiful writer herself. And so um, if for no other reason you want to read this book because she writes beautiful prose. So she not only selected wonderful quotes that we can chew on for a long time, but she herself has beautiful prose that we can think about for a long time. So thank you again to Academic Press, to Matthew specifically, and um, thank you, Gaia, for writing this fascinating book. I wish you all a, a good evening and um, hope to see you again. I hope we have another occasion to chat with each other. Stay healthy, everyone. Really beautiful. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you Pasia. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you all so much.